Welcome to the Industry Experts Panel at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. My name is Michelle Holliday. Today, we are welcoming back to the show the great Mr. Alice Dare McLeod. Alice Dare is a global precious metals expert. He has extensive knowledge on what is happening behind the scenes on a worldwide basis when it comes to precious metals. Alice Dare is head of research at GoldMoney.com. He has been a member of the London Stock Exchange for over four decades. His expertise covers worldwide bond markets, corporate finance, investment strategies, and precious metals. We, of course, are very fortunate to have him as a good friend, and we call upon his expertise to stay informed on his outside global perspective, which is often hidden from the United States. Alice Stair, welcome back to the show. How are you today? I'm very well, and thank you for asking me, Michelle. Oh, we are thrilled to have you here. It's always so much fun to get your perspective. And right now, there is so much going on around the world. This is going to be an incredible show. I want to start off with the currencies around the world. Alistair, give us a global perspective of what is happening right now. Well, I think we have to start with the dollar because that's King Rat in the fiat currency world. Um, and it, 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 we're at a very interesting juncture because if you're a foreigner, you look at America, you look at the dollar, you see the Fed printing and printing and printing dollars. You see the new president who has just passed a little under two trillion deal uh, in sort of stimulus uh, uh, deal. And on top of that, they're talking about another, is it five trillion on um, infrastructure and um, green energy and all the rest of it. I mean, that is seven trillion dollars. I mean, you know, what's going on? Should I hold my dollars with all this debasement? And I think that um, the rise in interest rates that we're seeing, or rather bond yields, um, they've backed off a little bit this week, but it's been really quite sudden. It's really the market, I think, reassessing the uh, inflation prospects on the back of all this money printing. So from a foreigner's point of view, what he's looking at is a potential loss of purchasing power of the dollar. So what does he want to continue to hold on to his dollar? The answer is he's going to require higher interest rates. And um, of course, the Fed is not going to be keen to see higher interest rates. And everybody's been talking about yield curve control and all the rest of it. One thing we know is that the Fed is going to be behind the curve when it comes to rising rates. It must be that because the Fed's primary function at the moment isn't to control inflation, but to fund the government. And that means it's going to have to continue to print, print, print. So as a foreigner, I don't think I'd like holding excess dollars. And I think that's going to determine what happens in the coming months to the dollar, because there's this growing realization that price inflation is going to be picking up. Yes, we all know that because um, you know money's been sitting there in bank accounts. The government has given you guys money to go and spend. And as soon as lockdown ends, you're going to rush out and spend it. <laughs> so we know that prices are going to go up because when you suddenly get an injection of money like that, you haven't got the production to meet the extra demand. And the result is only one thing, prices rise. Uh, the uh, trade deficit increases because obviously uh, it's cheaper to buy imports than let's say ma locally manufactured products. And there are other problems. Uh, I mean, particularly on the food front, I don't know what your experience is in California, but I would guess that uh, you're seeing rising food prices already. And you have probably beginning to wonder about uh, what the prices are going to be like later on this year and in the winter when fresh vegetables and so on and so forth are not so easily obtainable. This is um, a, an inflation story all of a sudden. And I think people are really beginning to worry about it, even in the investment community. So consequently, I think the outlook is weaker dollar, higher inflation. Talk to us about what else is happening across the planet, Alistair. Talk to us about the UK and what are other countries experiencing right now in comparison to here in the United States? Well, um, 
I'll just say a tiny bit about the UK. Uh, we have vaccinated ourselves pretty well. I think over half the adult population is now vaccinated and has got their first vaccination. Obviously, the second one is following on. Um, the, um, the government budget arithmetic is absolutely shot. I mean, it really is. And they don't, you know, the government know that they need to balance the books, but they know that by raising taxes, uh, they're going to stifle any economic recovery. So they don't really know what to do. They're sort of fiddling around somewhere along in the middle. Now, so far, this is not a disaster for us, but um, it's got the makings of one, perhaps. Rather than just looking at the UK, I think the more important story is Europe. And if we start with the vaccines, there has been a complete failure of vaccine policy. They were late ordering. Um, the lady who is in charge uh, of the, pre the current president of the EU actually has a rather unfortunate history of managing procurement. Uh, she was defense minister in Germany at one stage. And uh, it appears that, uh, they, uh, that um, her ministry screwed up the order for uh, rifles. And as a result, the German soldiers attended a NATO uh, uh, gathering with broomsticks, carrying broomsticks instead of rifles. I mean, would you believe it? Now, Are this you serious? Lady, You're uh, not joking. Yeah, no, this is incredible. This lady is now in charge of the EU. And not only that, but her procurement policy has just completely failed on the vaccine front. So there's a lot of blaming going on, blaming and naming and shaming, everything you can imagine. But, um, you know, this actually has serious consequences because the whole of the European Union is a good six months behind America and the UK, maybe even more. They're entering third lockdowns in France, Germany, Italy, Spain. You know, it's just getting worse. And when it, and the latest thing that's really come out in the last week or so is that there is actually going to be no travel into Europe from tourists. There's going to be no travel from the UK into Europe. I mean, we, you know, we typically have holidays either in Spain or France or Italy. I mean, those are our holiday destinations. They're all closed. So this is going to be a disaster for uh, those economies. Now, those economies uh, have a problem because um, with economic recovery from the uh, virus delayed, government finances, which are already a mess, particularly in Greece, Italy, Spain, Portugal, France, uh, and in such a mess, you wouldn't believe it. I mean, Greece's jet, uh, government debt to GDP is around about 200%. Uh, Italy is looking at 170%. France is ab up to about, I think, 120%. I and mean, these, are, these are enormous numbers, Michel. How does a government recover, recover from this? I mean, the problem is that all this financing of government debt has been through the ECB. The, the single most important function of the ECB is to ensure that the governments can continue to spend. And it has actually screwed the amount of finance available for uh, genuine uh, economic business in the EU. So the whole thing is actually failing. The banks are, in, I mean, their balance sheets are um, appalling to look at. Now, I think in the very short term, um, because the euro is, is under-owned internationally, whereas the dollar is over-owned internationally, if we had a crisis tomorrow, and let's say that both systems fell over more or less at the same time, I think the euro would probably go up against the dollar. But I think that's a short term thing, because what we're looking at is a failure of a complete system, which basically will take down the currency as well. So, um, you know, I'm not really full of happy stories, I'm afraid, for you <laughs> this time. Um, you know, perhaps we should talk about something else. <laughs> <laughs> Let's turn to precious metals. <laughs> right. That sounds better. <laughs> there we go. You know, we just thought that we were headed into this fantastic bull run in silver, right? Mm. We had the, yep. the, the silver short squeeze and everybody was jumping on board and then February hit and it stopped and it dropped. And it's very, very interesting and it has sort of stayed very steady and very stable. Even mm. gold prices have been somewhat 
twist, if you will. Yeah. Talk to us about what is happening. I'll tell you why this is so mysteriously interesting, too. And maybe you can add to this. Um, I just had Andy Sheckman on this show, which is the owner and president of Miles Franklin. And we spoke about this. It appears that many mints throughout the world are receiving orders for silver that they cannot deliver. And so this really makes no sense if there's no supply and yet this is not reflected in the prices. What Indeed. is your perspective here? Well, um, I can tell you the answer to that. And that is um, the price depends actually at what you're looking at. You know, if you're looking at the price, if you think you're looking at the price of silver, you're not looking at the price of silver because quite honestly or quite sensibly, uh, if there is no silver available, the price has to go up to a level where it does become available. And that is somewhat above the current level because it's not available now. What you're looking at in the markets is the, is the paper price. In other words, um, I can tell you what I'm going to sell paper silver for. Um, I cannot tell you what I can sell real silver for. Paper silver pretends to be real silver. That's what we're looking at now. If I'm a bank, and let's assume that I'm a bullion bank for the purpose of this story, um, I can expand my balance sheet as much as I want and print futures contracts in silver, boom, 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 until all demand is satisfied. And that basically is what has been happening in both gold and silver since the peaks back, well, in the case of gold back in August, and silver recently when we had that weekend run up and it briefly uh, breached the $30 level. So the answer really to what's going on is uh, the system, if you like, the establishment and the establishment basically being bullion banks and in the case of gold, also central banks don't really want to see higher prices. They want to keep a control on prices. Why? Because even at current levels, the bullion banks are losing money. And in the case of gold, um, currently they are losing around but I think the net loss works out at something like $21 billion spread amongst 30-odd bullion banks. So this is, this is not trivial. Now, they have actually managed to reduce it down from a worse position where they were almost $50 billion in the hole. Um, they would therefore likely to do a bit more. And we are speaking today, the day before the um, April... Um, uh, futures contracts, option dealings cease. So um, tomorrow is the last day of option dealings. So what do the bullion banks want to do? They want to get the price down to ensure that as many contracts as possible expire worthless. So that's going to happen. That's going to happen. So you know, if you think that silver is you know cheap at this level, yes, it is cheap at this level. Um, but you're not buying silver; you're buying paper silver. Now, if, on the other hand, you do have a certain amount of money, why not go in and buy paper silver tomorrow when they mark it down? And I would guess they'll probably get it down below $25 an ounce. Go in, buy your paper silver, and then stand for delivery. Then you might get some silver. But you won't be popular amongst the bullion banks, I can tell you that. <laughs> They'll be out for you. <laughs> wow. What an interesting explanation. Because Andy was saying, you know, the wholesalers are able to get their physical, but people ordering, it's three months, six mm, months, yeah. and this perfectly explains the delay. It has everything mm. to do with what they want their timing to be. Yeah, and I'm not sure that the wholesalers can really get very much either. I mean, if you really want to get anything in real size, uh, and, you know, let's let's talk institutionally. Let's talk sort of real money in gold. Let's say you want to get five, ten tons, something like that. No chance. I mean, you get quoted by the refineries. You know, maybe something like April, late April, May, if you're lucky. Um, so. It's, there's no stock around at this price, really, in any meaningful sense. I mean, these markets are far larger than, say, a few rounds of coins or a, f or a few kilo bars of gold. I mean, you know, if this, is a, this is a market where real money counts. And um, if you want to deal in a sensible amount in that environment, then it's just not available. It's as simple as that. So this is going to be interesting because 
Yeah, as I say, we've got the last day of dealing for options tomorrow in gold and silver contracts on COMEX. Uh, and I think, um, is it next Monday or Tuesday or thereabouts? I think there's the last uh, day for dealing in the April contract on both of them. Now, in gold, it is interesting because gold is the, um, the active contract. So there are lots and lots of outstanding contracts there. So we're going to be very interested to see how much actually stands as opposed to how much is sold or rolled over into the next active contract. And I'll just add another point before we, I bore everybody on this subject. <laughs> and that is that COMEX is not a market which was intended for people to, take, to use to take delivery of gold. Uh, the idea of having, um, you know, the sort of, if you like, the option at the end of the contract to be able to take delivery or to sell or to roll it over was basically to tie the contract price to the physical. And, you know, absolutely fine. It does that once a month. But it was never intended to be used for that purpose. So um, and virtually every day uh, for the last two or three months, we have seen gold deliveries coming out of COMEX, and it's mounted up. I mean, I think the, the, the figure this year so far, I did calculate, and I think it's an order of about 100 and something tons has been quietly delivered in dribs and drabs every day. Uh, and we're seeing the same thing in silver. I mean, the tonnages in silver are far larger, obviously, um, because each contract is 5,000 ounces, whereas a, um, a gold con contract is only 100 ounces. So, yeah, it's... It's interesting that change is going on uh, and we don't yet know the full ramifications of this. It's very interesting. There's huge well, also, Yes. Also, uh, just if I can just sort of um, put yourself in the shoes of uh, uh, a bullion bank. Um, you went short, let us say, um, back in March, something like that, because, you know, the price started taking off and you couldn't actually get your short positions closed. So around about then you were getting into difficulties. You saw your short position increase. Um, you probably got your boss. In other words, all bullion banks are basically owned by another bank. So, you know, the boss right up at the top says, I want you to cut your market making positions because we haven't got the balance room, balance sheet space to carry a billion dollars worth of a short position. So tell me, when can you cut your position? He's got that pressure. The second pressure is that uh, back in March last year, uh, that lovely man, Jay Pyle, said, we are going to do whatever it takes. I mean, he didn't actually use Mario Draghi's words, but as good as. Um, it was 120 billion every month in QE. It was going to help out, uh, you know, sort of the corporate loan market. I mean, and there were all sorts of other little things which, uh, it basically was a statement that whatever it takes, we will print as much money, suppress interest rates, do whatever it, it, it is required in order for the system not to fall over. And that actually coincided with the first lockdowns, more or less. But well, certainly our, our lockdown was on exactly the same day, the 23rd of March. Um, you may remember that uh, the Friday before, uh, interest rates uh, had been reduced to zero from one and a half. So this was a very sudden change of tactic. Now you're a bullion bank and you've got yourself short and you see the price rising. In fact, it rose to was it uh, $2,070 at the very peak. And you're going, oh, no, this is terrible. <laughs> um, you know, my boss is saying I've got to cut the position and my losses are escalating. It has been a very difficult time for the bullion banks, and they have needed a lot of patience and a lot of skill to persuade a lot of your uh, uh, viewers that um, uh, if you really want to hedge against inflation, go and buy Bitcoin. Leave gold alone. Gold's going down. Yeah, silver's going down. And uh, I mean, this, this sort of, um, you know, Robin Hood thing was, uh, well, we can sit on that. We'll just sit on it and keep it suppressed. And, um, you know, but there's no silver, no gold. I, they're playing a game which is very dangerous. They have played it very skillfully so far. They're still short of over $20 billion on um, COMEX. I know that there is very little silver and gold free for uh, a float, if you like, in London. I know the situation is the same in Switzerland. 
Um, the wires have been going hot and what's going on in, with the Perth Mint, who uh, apparently when you turn up and say, I want to buy some silver, like, you know, in kilo bars or whatever, they turn you away, but they say they've got loads and loads of silver. Um, I think a figure like sort of 40, 50 tons was mentioned, uh, which was going to be available if needed for uh, um, uh, the Comex market. So, you know, you, there's lots and lots of trying to, um, you know, stop the silver from running out of the door at the same time that all these banks are horribly short. So what happens? I mean, the market's obviously being distorted. The market wins in the end. And um, I suspect that the end of this month is quite important in terms of the short term timing. But the real story, I think, behind this is we are looking at the very early stages of a collapse in the purchasing power of the currencies. Going back to what I was saying about the dollar and euro earlier. Now, I don't know when it's going to happen. I mean, it might happen overnight. It might happen in three months' time. It might happen next year. I don't know. The indications are that the crisis is coming upon us really quite rapidly. Now, when it happens, I think you're either going to have gold or silver, or you haven't. And if you've got ETFs, if you've got uh, paper gold, um, you know, good luck to you. <laughs> you may be able to recover something out of it, but the only thing to have is the physical. Right, right. I love this explanation that you're giving everyone because it shows what a masquerade is going on in terms mm. of, because everybody who is not um, privy to the information that you are watches silver go back down again. Oh, we thought it was a bull run. Oh, they've been talking about precious metals being so valuable for years and years. They don't know what they're talking about. We're going back into Bitcoin or whatever. And mm. the truth of the matter is that what is happening behind the scenes tells the story. There's yeah. no physical delivery. The prices are being suppressed. The mm. short situations with, you know, massive positions taking place. And this leads me into Bitcoin uh, just for a bit. I know your perspective on Bitcoin is not um, stellar. You wouldn't suggest it to um, anyone, but um, what would you say to people that are really looking at this situation right now in terms of silver and feeling disappointed? I really want to drive it home to everyone. Take some of what you've earned out of Bitcoin and out of the stocks that you were able to um, ride up and put them in to silver, physical silver and gold right now. I really want you to tell them why. What is going to happen? Well, right. Yeah, I think uh, it's uh, this is fascinating. I, I don't have anything against Bitcoin. I, you know, um, what Bitcoin has done is it has alerted people who wouldn't otherwise have understood anything about money, that there is a big difference between a form of money, let's call it that for the moment, uh, where um, the expansion of the quantity in circulation is very severely restricted, and fiat currencies, where demonstrably there is no restriction on the printing of money, the expansion of the quantity in circulation. And so if you understand that basic argument, then what you're probably doing from an investment stance is you are buying some Bitcoin with a view to taking your profits back in your dollars at a later stage. I mean, that's investment rationale. You, 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 you manage your investments on a valuation basis measured in dollars, okay? So Bitcoin goes from, say, $5,000 to $55,000. I mean, absolutely brilliant. Your portfolio looks brilliant. I think, lovely, great, wonderful. I mean, I hope it goes to a million for those who've got it and all the rest of it. And it will make lots and lots of people very, very happy. But I have two words of caution on this. And the first is, when I look at the final outcome, um, what we are likely to see, and this is the justification, the real justification behind Bitcoin, we're likely to see a collapse in the purchasing power of paper currencies. So the dollar suddenly will start buying you nothing or very, very little. And it will get to a stage where um, in order to, for the government to pay any bills at all, it will need to stabilize the value of the dollar. So how does it do it? 
The only way it can do it is to mobilize its gold reserves. Um, the US Treasury says that it has 8,134 tons of gold. That is a lot of gold. It can use that to back the dollar. In, by back the dollar, what I mean is that um, a foreigner in particular will have the option of uh, taking payment in dollars or exchanging those dollars for gold. And it must be at the dollar holder's option. That's the whole point. This also should be extended to domestic residents in America, the same facility. Now, if the government does that, then it will stop the depreciation in its currency and it will have instead a sound form of money. The Bitcoin people would say, well, hold on a minute, gold is forget it and all the rest of it. But they, they cannot argue against one thing, and that is central banks own no Bitcoin. Not only that, they don't like the idea of a distributed ledger over which they have no control. So when it comes to actually dealing with a crisis, is it going to be Bitcoin or gold? There is only one answer, and that is gold. So that's quite simple. So what we can conclude is that Bitcoin will end along with fiat currencies, because at that point, any function it has will be over. So the idea that Bitcoin can replace paper currencies, fiat currencies, I'm afraid is wrong from the practical point of view of how the central banks will secure uh, the government's finances in the future. Um, the other thing I must say is that when I look at um, all the sort of stories about Bitcoin and who's getting involved, most of these people haven't got a clue what they're talking about. They don't understand money. Remember that the basis is the same as every other bubble. I've got to buy these things and my valuation is going to go sky high. And at some stage, I'll take a profit. And at the moment, they're talking, when I mean, you talk to anyone, they'll say it's going to go to $150,000, $300,000. What am I bid? A million dollars? You know, they're going, that is what they're saying. This is precisely what happens in every extreme bubble. There does get this point where everybody believes this wonderful thing is going to go on forever and I'm going to be rich as a result. And that is exactly the psychology we have with Bitcoin. And you only know that that's true after the event. So I would say to anyone who's long of Bitcoin, I mean, love the ride, great. Um, but just think a little bit about that final outcome, will it actually be used? I mean, can you imagine um, a company, let's say, um, in a Bitcoin environment where Bitcoin is the money? Let's say a company wants to um, uh, develop a new um, uh, gadget of some sort, and it's going to take, obviously, some money and some time to accumulate the machinery, to accumulate the factory, to get the workers, to train them, to produce the, you know, that widget that you're going to do and all the rest of it. Say it takes five years. Okay, I borrow Bitcoin today. What have I got to pay back in five years time? What does that do to the business calculation of the production of my widgets? Well, hold on. We have a situation where there is absolutely no expansion in the money supply as such, the money supply being the total amount of Bitcoins shared all the way around the world. No expansion of that whatsoever. So inevitably what happens is I'm looking at a very deflationary outlook. I'm looking at something where I cannot possibly invest to manufacture something uh, and make a profit on it because the cost of repaying the loan, which I took out to get the whole thing going, or even if it's my own capital, investing my own capital in production. You know, I'm far better just holding on to my Bitcoin and watching it go up. I mean, obviously, this is not a practical monetary environment. And the great thing about gold is that um, it is flexible. Um, uh, for a start, you've got mine supply. And the other thing you've got is scrap supply. I mean, if you really do get monetary demand for gold, about 50% or more of gold, above ground gold. So we're looking at, at about 100,000 tons of gold. It's held in jewelry. You've probably got some on you. You know, and if, if it goes up enough, you'll say, I'm going to sell this. 
<laughs> Do you see what I mean? Mm-hmm. That there, there is that flexibility, and 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 equally, um, if demand for if demand for gold back money goes down, um, you know, then uh, Michelle would be buying more jewelry. You know, so in other words, there is that automatic uh, ability to expand the quantity of monetary gold in circulation being used in the economy, and this is a very very important difference between gold and uh, the cryptocurrencies. It is. It's such an important point. And I rarely hear people talking about it because you have to be realistic if you go into a crisis. Mm. That's it. If you yep. are in crisis mode and you think a crisis is coming, your realistic sense of things has got to kick in. And what's happening right now is we see a lot of euphoria when it comes to people that are holding Bitcoin and then anguish as it drops and then euphoria as it rises. They're, they're so um, hypnotized by what's happening with Bitcoin that they are completely ignoring what's happening with fiat currency. And I'm going to say it that way because people are like, oh, no, Michelle, we know exactly what's happening with fiat currency. It's overprinted. That's why we're in Bitcoin. That's why we mm. hate fiat. Mm. And my response to that is, no, you're ignoring what's happening to fiat currency, because the reality is, just like you said, the central banks which control it will also be in control when that crisis hits and your Bitcoin that you have invested in things and paid for things and made loans against is going to put you in a crisis mode. So what you just said, watch it go up. And then take your profits mm. is beautiful, but keep in the back of your mind that realistic point of view that in a crisis mode, Bitcoin yeah. is zero. It may indeed have peaked already. I mean, I just put that thought to you. Yeah, you know, with everybody talking about it going to the moon, um, and there's almost no one, no one saying that it could go down. I mean, there are a few people like Peter Schiff was saying, oh, it's not, you know, that this isn't money and therefore it's, it's, it's all a bubble and all the rest of it. But I mean, he's a voice in the wilderness. He really is. And he's always been saying that. So people now poo-poo him. You know and what I'm like, saying? Exactly. exactly. Yeah. No, you're dead right. You're absolutely right. The other way to look at it is, th- is this. If you make an investment, and I could try and do a definition which, which make, puts the thing into perspective. If you make an investment, you buy something, a financial asset, with a view to selling it in the future. If you buy gold, you buy it with the intention of spending it in the future. Now, that is very, very different from taking a profit. In the environment in which we're in, obviously, the vast majority of people who go out and buy gold, whether it's in ETFs or whatever, um, they're actually not looking to spend it. They're not thinking that far ahead. They're thinking gold is cheap. I think it might go up to $2,000, $3,000, $4,000, and then I'll take my profits is the psychology. But, um, you know, life doesn't work out as easily as that. And when you've got a system which is clearly on the edge of failure, um, then, you know, if you're sensible enough to buy physical gold and take delivery of it, um, or store it in somewhere where it's, it's outside the banking system, which advert here, which is what we do at Gold Money, uh, then uh, you will survive that, um, you know, sort of fall off the financial precipice. But, um, you know, if you're, if you're actually sort of just thinking that this is a price, you know, and the price today is 1700 bucks or 1726 whatever it is, I think I can probably buy it and then sell it and get a profit at $2,000, let's say. You're not thinking straight. That's not what this is about. So the difference is between investing and spending it. Can I go on? I, can, am I being very boring? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> we want to hear you. Every word you have to say, we want to hear. Um, <laughs> well, we are in a mode right now. I want everybody to understand it's very important I, what he just broke down. The world is on a tipping point. There is well, a change is. coming. Right. Yeah. And funny enough, I think a lot of people do understand that. I mean, they, you know, they can't express it. Um, but let's look at the situation where the collapse in the paper currency's purchasing power occurs. Uh, the reason I put it this way is that most people think in terms of prices rising, but actually what's happening when all prices are rising or the general level of prices are, is rising, uh, then uh, the 
purchasing power of the money in which you measure those prices is going down. It's as simple as that. Well, take yourself back to um, Germany in 1923, early 1923. Uh, the uh, paper market already uh, fallen in its purchasing power very, very substantially. It had lost something, I guess, at the beginning of that uh, year. It had lost about 99.5% of its purchasing power. So it still had a little bit left, okay? We were getting to the stage. I mean, this was just before, you know, the sort of, um, uh, you know, the wheelbarrows of, no of notes, you know, sort of left it outside the shop and then the, the notes were left on the, on the pavement and the wheelbarrow had been stolen <laughs> just before then, <laughs> just before then. Um, now, let us say that you decided that you wanted to buy a house in Berlin. Uh, let's get a, you know, six bedroom house in a swanky part of Berlin. Do you know what you could have bought it for in, in uh, uh, dollars? A hundred bucks. That was the price. In yes, US dollars? Cost. Yeah, absolutely. Now, it was billions. I mean, you know, billions and billions and billions of marks. But the problem is that in a, a currency collapse of that sort, the middle classes are wiped out. I mean, they are impoverished. So they need to sell the things that they don't immediately need. And that is why $100 could buy you the house in Berlin, six bedrooms, swanky street, district, whatever, whatever. But you had to have the foreign currency. Now, the reason that this relates back to what we're talking today is that in those days, uh, there were uh, $20.67 to the ounce of gold. So we're looking at just under five ounces of gold bought you that house. That's why you should have gold when you get a paper currency collapse. Right. And if various fiats are collapsing and you really don't know because you can't predict the future on where what will sit, precious metals always have been and always will be. As you say, they're the past and they're the future of real yep. money. Ever since, ever since the end of barter. <laughs> Talk to us about when that was and what. just nutshell that for us real quick. Everyone. Yeah, yeah. Uh, since the end of barter, I mean, you know, when we stopped, when we stopped swapping things, <laughs> and we had uh, something that acted as an intermediary store of value between me, let's say, me making things. You know, I might make make shoes or something like that. You buy shoes. Um, instead of us coming to some agreement that what you make, um, you know, you'll swap some of that for what I make, um, we had gold or silver or copper indeed in the middle acting, um, you know, on a weight basis as a means of exchange. So, um, uh, you know, I would sell you the shoes I make um, and you would pay me in, say, copper or silver or I mean, if they're very expensive shoes, uh, gold. Um, so, so, but that, that was the function. That, and that was how money started. And in some places, it started with uh, cowrie shells, you know, particularly if you're a long way from the sea. These things were, oh, oh you know, they were sort of yeah. you know, pretty, unusual. Where do we get some more? Well, the answer is, <laughs> if I want more cowrie shells, I better sell you a shoe or two in return for for some curries. So that's how money started post barter. And it is always when it, when money has gone wrong, it is because it has gone away from gold or silver or copper. And when it goes wrong, it returns to gold, silver and copper. And that is what we're going to see again. It's not Bitcoin because, uh, well, I've just said why it's not Bitcoin. I mean, <laughs> Uh, and um, it's going to be gold, silver, or copper again. So don't be fooled by the weakness in the silver price, the gold price. There are very good reasons why that is happening. And it has an awful lot to do with the losses that uh, the bullion bank community are trying to shake themselves off. And, of course, the central banks are trying to help. I mean, um, we found in August last year, GLD, which is the big uh, gold ETF, um, has a custodian, which is JP Morgan. Now, um, there is the ability for the custodian to appoint sub-custodians. And I think it was in early August, we suddenly saw that, uh, I think it was about 48 tonnes of gold was being held in the Bank of England. How did it get there? Well, the answer is quite simple. The Bank of England basically arranges, on behalf of other central banks, for their gold to be leased. 
to make sure that there is sufficient gold available for the market, uh, for the market to continue to function. Um, now, you know, you'd say this is an admirable thing, um, but there is a problem because uh, with a leasing contract, ownership does not change. The ownership is, of that gold is still in the central bank that has actually leased it. But it appears in GLD's books as its gold. It has not got clear possession of that gold. If it is leased, <clears throat> that's the only reason it could have actually been shown to have been in the Bank of England's vaults, then there is a, a prior ownership over it. And it's not the property of GLD. So, you know, you've got to be aware that uh, when things go wrong in the financial system, they can go horribly wrong. And you can find that you think you have got some sort of entitlement to gold, say through an ETF share. And you find that either you can't really establish that entitlement or alternatively, um, there has been, um, you know, something has sort of happened, which is inexplicable. Um, and at that stage, nobody's going to go on trial. <laughs> <laughs> right. We don't know what happened or who did it. That is no, really I just story. don't get involved. You know, I just don't get involved. I mean, the, just have the real stuff. And, um, you know, there, there is also a sort of a Midas feeling, you know, when mm. it sort of offsets a little bit the, the misery that we face from all this money printing. I, it is going to be miserable, I, I can tell you, because very, very few people have the protection against what is going to happen. But when you sort of accumulate some gold, you sort of feel a lot more comfortable and mm -hmm. a lot more. I mean, I'm talking about the physical stuff mm -hmm. and you feel that um, you're insulated, you're insured against a lot of these increasing uncertainties in, in life. And that, I can tell you, is a better feeling than the one of sort of worrying about the price going up or down, say, 10, 20, 100 dollars. That, that's immaterial. The thing is, sleep at night with a bit of insurance. It's a very instinctive, protective feeling. It is, yes. absolutely. Yeah. And we are still human in spite of <laughs> right. everything that's happened to us. We want to feel protected. <laughs> you know, this has been um, such an amazing explanation of what's gone on in the past 60 days or so because people, um, uh, like I said, they see the price drop as far as silver went and then sort of stay there and they see gold still down. So they equate it with a lack of value. They move on about their life, but they don't realize the panic mode that mm. happened to huge amounts of shorts out there of the institutional systems that would fall if those prices mm -hmm. rose. And that's the reason they've been kept down. Don't underestimate your precious metals investments and the protection they provide for the crisis that is being created, Alastair. I mean, there's no getting around that there's going to be a change, right? Yeah. I, what, um, it, it may be of interest to your viewers that um, on Gold Money, I write an Insight article, which is published on Thursday afternoon EST, so Thursday morning your time. Um, and I do a market report on precious metals, which is released on the Friday. Um, and that's written, obviously, during European time, because I'm on the other side of the world from you. Um, but, you know, hopefully in that there will be some useful information as to, as to you know, what has been happening in the market and yeah. uh, the position of the various interested parties. I really think that your reports are, if, if everybody just, you know, subscribes to one or two people, you cover the precious metals market in such an amazing way because you're global. You look at what's happening behind the scenes in your prediction. You know, there are so many other precious metal um, authors and uh, journalists, but really they just cover what everybody sees. And mm. that's the difference between your reports and everybody else. So I want everyone, that was my next topic. I want everybody to um, subscribe to him. And also Alistair, could you please give everybody a brief overview of what, gold money is and also talk about the numbers that you guys control because it gives everyone a perspective of you know you are uh, a, a significant entity in the world <laughs> well money. it's yes. it's a pretty small market because very few people really um understand the need for owning physical gold and silver but 
you know, as long as things don't fall over immediately, I think it's going to be a growing market. Basically, what we do is uh, we store gold and silver. We we give um, people the opportunity to buy and sell precious metals on our, uh, you know, on our website, and we store it in a vault of your choice. Um, and we've got, I think, about eleven vaults around the world. So. Typically, I mean, we find um, uh, our American uh, uh, customers are very often worried that, um, uh, you know, one of the responses to a problem is that your government might do what um, Roosevelt did back in 1933 and confiscate gold. Uh, so what do you do? You can store your gold in a vault in a foreign jurisdiction, say Switzerland. We offer that facility. Singapore, we offer that facility, London, or Toronto, if you want to go walk over the border and, <laughs> and have a look at your gold and walk back again. Well, you can't do that because these are LBMA vaults and uh, they are highly secure. Is it they're insured and all the rest of it? Um, you can have your gold delivered, but um, I'm afraid you can't go and <laughs> go and see it, but it is in the vaults. And we, the, 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 a number of things that are very important to understand on this. We do regular metal audits, and then we do regular financial audits of the metal audits. So there's a sort of two-tier auditing system. None of our customers' gold, silver, platinum group metals is on our balance sheet. We act as pure custodians. And um, the key thing is that this is stored outside the banking system in secure vaults. Um, the point about that is that when a bank goes, you know, falls over, um, and we are heading as part of the crisis, is going to be a banking crisis. Make no mistake about it. When banks go belly up, then um, you know, you may indeed have, um, let's say, allocated gold stored with them. They say it was allocated, but when you get there, you probably find it's gone. So you, you know, we just don't know. Um, but the safest thing always, if you're going to have gold stored somewhere secure, is to have it outside the banking system. Um, and that basically is what we do. So, we, you know, you can, you can buy and sell your gold through us um, and we store it for you um, and we can move it from one vault to another if you, you, know, if you, if you want to. Um, and we can arrange for delivery. So uh, all those very basic things. Um, I mean, so far, I think we've got a bit over two... $2 billion of, of gold and silver in storage. A lot of it's silver, I have to say, because people do understand the silver story quite well. Um, and you've also got, I mean, people like uh, Eric Sprott, you know, in, in Canada, who, who um, you know, have been talking about silver for a very long time. And so there are lots of people who do have a good understanding of silver. But anyway, that's basically what we do. And um, I do the research because part of all this is informing people uh, about uh, gold, silver, why you should own it, perhaps why you shouldn't own it, I, you know, whatever. <laughs> and so, so in that, you know, I, I write about obviously precious metals. I also write about economics. And also coming into this, because gold in particular is such an important um, issue around the world, there is a geopolitical element to it. And so I study and write about that as well. Yes, yes. Tell everyone where they can go to find your articles. Goldmoney.com. And then there's a tab which says research. Hit that tab and you'll get insights. And that's where my Thursday articles are posted. And then there's a, a market report or market update, or I can't remember quite what they called it. And that's where my market reports are posted on the Friday. So Thursday for the insights, Friday for the market reports. Alistair, thank you so much for coming on the show today. This has been brilliant. Oh, it's very much my pleasure, Michelle. Thank you for asking me. Yes, and we will have you back soon. I would look forward to it. Absolutely. Mr. Alistair McLeod, precious metals expert and head of research at goldmoney.com. For the industry experts panel, I'm Michelle Holliday at portfoliowealthglobal.com.